we are excited to welcome our next guest speaker. Many of you probably know him, and if you don't, I recommend knowing him soon. So this is Kevin Quishan. He works strategically with HPA to support our dental members. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to kick it off and uh, turn it over to Kevin. Welcome, Kevin. Well, cool, thanks. And I know this is being recorded, so for everybody that's um, here, great. I'm glad you're here in person. If you ever watch it in the future, I hope it's still helpful. Um, it never matters to me how many people are here. I figure if it's um, if I can have a positive impact or influence on one person, um, that's that's plenty for me. So uh, um, so I'm happy to be here. I do see some familiar names, people I'm working with, so that's sort of cool. And um, so what I'm going to do is. Uh, share my screen um, and start the presentation and then you just get to hear my voice for a little bit so let's do this and <clears throat> pardon me that should be perfect um, and you know although i'm not a big fan of always slides and not seeing somebody but um, when we're talking about occlusion sometimes it's it's a lot easier to use some visual aids and see things um, in a different light so um, I, I'm excited to spend the next hour and I'll sort of watch the clock as well and, and make sure we've got time for any questions towards the end. Uh, but for me, an hour of occlusion, you, you might think to yourself, well, what can I learn about occlusion in an hour? And my answer is a lot, um, a lot. And if, even if all it does is it helps you see your patient, um, your next patient a little bit differently, it helps you understand why things are happening and maybe make us a, a choice um a little more intentionally that makes a difference and that is what i would that's my hope and my expectation for everybody here this morning and you know when we talk about occlusion you know some i i am a fan of t-scan but i put this up here for conversation because sometimes when our patient says you know it still feels high um or i'm st it still feels a little bumpy or it just doesn't feel right and we put the articulating tape in um some things what we can't see with the articulating tape what the t-scan might help us identify however with a deeper understanding of occlusion um, and things to look for the you can you can use your articulating tape differently and see things maybe you didn't see you know when we talk about occlusion it can also be removable prosthesis or or some type of a hybrid or an implant retained or supported um, restoration. And certainly occlusions can have a big impact on how that feels and how long it lasts. And as we start to treatment plan a little bit differently, and we start to use all of whether it's 3Shape or ExoCAD um, or um, CERAC InLab or, any of the software out there, you know, when we create the teeth to look the way we want them to look, they also have a job. How do they function? And that's one of the things I hope to share with you today. Because historically, when we think about using software like DSD, and I'm a, I'm a fan of DSD, I, I wasn't totally a fan early on because I think people were using it to help sell our patients, which was great, except the dilemma was uh, things were breaking. So you'd go through and, and plan and help your patient see what's possible, and then it either didn't feel right or it broke or it chipped, and that's pretty frustrating as well. And as we move into the digital world, as we start scanning upper and lower arches and we have a CBCT, and then we can literally track and record jaw movement, what we have here more and more is a truly individualized fully adjustable articulator. However, if if you, and I will say you not in a judgmental way, but maybe I should say we, but if you and we don't really have an understanding of what that means or how we would use it or how, how we're seeing the whole chewing system, it's not going to be so helpful. And as we continue to then use facial scans plus jaw recording, uh, jaw movement recording, and scanning the upper and lower arch to decide where the teeth belong in the face, maybe it's going to help your dentistry last longer if we can see that where teeth belong in the face is du directly corresponds to how they function and why they're functioning the way they function. And so 
for me, what I want to share with you today is how do we help our dentistry more predictable? And occlusion is a big part of that. And when we use the words like comprehensive, um, occlusion is part of that. Patient-centered, well, you know, how does their bite feel? Health-centered, can they chew healthy foods? And all of that has to do with occlusion. And the case you see on the right side of your screen, we're going to go all the way through today because occlusion um, can play a big role in under identifying how occlusion plays a role makes everything we do more predictable. Now, when we talk about occlusion, and we won't go into all of the details for this right now, but um, you know, back in the day, nathology, which was basically a steward, and when we talk about where the condyle was, it's rearmost, uppermost, midmost, and it was it was more tripodization. You might remember that from dental school and your frustrations around it. And it was it was very deep fossas and steep angles that were just near misses made sense, but very difficult to create and not so predictable. Now, a lot of us are in the Pacific Northwest and bioaesthetics really started up here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, and it really, we, we took that from natural meaning, and I put that in quotes um, because form follows function. And basically it was a whole bunch of cadavers that Dr. Lee looked at and said, well, where, what's the correlation between healthy joints and healthy teeth? And just he started taking measurements um, about how long are the teeth, where do they belong in the head, and they use a MAGO, which is a maxillary anterior guided orthotic, to help um, the patient experience optimal, and there it, it makes sense as well. And then neuromuscular, a lot of you are familiar with, which was coined, um, you know, we all know it from mostly from uh, Bill Dickerson or LVI, um, using a tens unit, and, and then you see the ones down on the that are in yellow at the bottom, Panky Man Schuyler. Very influential, um, uh, Frank Spear, John Coyce, Pete Dawson. Those are all different concepts of occlusion. And don't forget, so is your existing bite, your acquired bite, your maximum intercuspation, what you have right now. And what's interesting to think about is when we start thinking about the camps we want to go into, where do we want to learn this? What is right and what is wrong? Is there one right answer? And the good news and the bad news is that they can all work. It's understanding how the chewing system works and what's appropriate and what might be in your best interest and what might not be in your best interest. And so for me, just so you know, my bias for today is I have a deep understanding with nabology. I have done training in bioaesthetics and, and understand that quite well. Um, I've taken courses from Dickerson down in Vegas and understand neuromuscular. However, for me, Panky Man Schuyler, Spear Coyce Dawson, and your existing occlusion all make most sense to me. They make most sense because there's some similarities and it, it, it's, it's just sort of more commonsensical for me for predictability and dentistry. For instance, if Orson walked into your office and he's 42 years old and you think to yourself, how in the world has he gotten where he is? And how can I do his dentistry predictably? And certainly occlusion is going to be a big part of predictability. Now, Tony, who walked in for a broken mesiolingual cusp on a lower second molar, is just like everybody we have in our practice right now. It scared her. She was worried that it was going to hurt. Um, it was rough to her tongue. She never quite experienced this before. And she just wanted that second molar fixed. However, if we take a step back and, and realize that maybe occlusion played a part in why it broke in the first place and how can we help, how can we make her treatment more predictable so it doesn't happen again and so it feels good and so it doesn't happen on any other teeth. That's where occlusion comes into play. So Kevin, when, yeah. Real quick, I just want to make sure, did you intend to start your presentation? It is started. I have been going down all of these slides. I'm so sorry. We're just seeing. I'm on, I'm on slide number 12. No, we're still just seeing the first there. So maybe let me go to my. That's so funny. Uh, these were spectacular slides, by the way. <laughs> um, so that's got to be boring as all hell. Um, sorry about so that. I was like, he's just is... getting into it. It's just a warm up. No, no. So let me do this. Now let's let's, that. maybe that's because we're on. I'm going to share and share screen. 
And let's, because maybe that's what did it. So I'm going to share Go screen. Share your desktop, whatever. Um, yeah, there's my desktop. Okay. You got it? Yep. And then you're going to have to, you missed all these cool slides with, oh, man. So if I start now, when I switch slides, do you, did it switch for you? Yes, we're perfect and now. Did it, and did it switch again? We got it. Yep. Oh, my God. This uh, That's just painful. That's just painful. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. So when we were talking about T-scan um, and also removable and also treatment planning for anterior teeth and also using DSD and also having a fully adjustable individualized articulator by combining CBCTs and scanning and movements and then also facial scanning, um, these are things that occlusion plays a role. I had to jump into that. And these were just words that I was talking about, comprehensive, patient-centered, health-centered, and occlusion-driven. And certainly these were the concepts I was talking about with respect to occlusion and the camps and asked you, is there one right answer and that they can all work? And so now to catch you up, and this is the fast version, this was Orson who I said, do you think occlusion plays a role? How did he get here and how do we get him out of that? And is, is occlusion gonna play a part of that? And then this is Tony who came in with the broken second with the broken cusp on the um, lower second molar. And we all have patients like her as well. Now you're caught back up to where I was. And so when we think about all of this and we now we evaluate Tony, how did she get to where she is? How is her whole chewing system working? And when we start to see things uh, a little more globally and then start to identify what does optimal look like for all of our patients? What would it look like if we didn't just repair them? I'm not saying we don't repair people, but if we could move them towards optimal a little bit more and we had a vision of that, this is where our confidence and our competence goes up a little bit. And that's one of the things I wanna sort of help with today. Now there is a third component to this, and that is who is the patient? What are the patient's core values? What are their hopes? How can we help them see what's possible and help create their preferred health, dental health future? It's when we're intentionally combining all three of these that I would say that we are doing dentistry that is appropriate for our patients to move our patients towards optimal health in a way that is appropriate for them. But Today, we're going to focus, obviously, mostly on occlusion, which means we have to identify how their current system is working, meaning when our patients come into us and we assess their current status, just how are they doing today? But when I say assess their current status, my hope for all of us a little bit more and more without judgment for, for you, and I want you to have compassion for yourself, is are we assessing the whole chewing system? joints, muscles, teeth, and periodontium, because that's going to help us understand how they got where they are and help increase the predictability as we treat them. And as we assess their current system, now this is very, this has been part of me since the late 1990s, what helps me, and maybe it'll help you, you know, next week when you go back into work, is when you're doing your evaluation of your patient's chewing system and understanding um, how it's working. For me, I always think I need to gather this information because I'm going to use it for treatment planning, for a systematic approach to treatment planning so that I can have a vision of what optimal looks like for my patient. So now when we think about doing the exam, it's like, oh, I need to gather information very intentionally. And it just makes it a little more fun because I'm not just gathering it for the sake of gathering it. I know I'm going to use it. Now, as far as the joint goes, if we actually just evaluate the joint, some people go, well, Kevin, why do, you, why do we evaluate the joint? Or they say that, but what they really mean is, I don't really know why I'm evaluating it, what it means, or how to evaluate it. And my hope is always that even though we can't look under the skin, that as we're evaluating it, we're thinking to ourselves, what is my best guess as to what I think is happening underneath the skin? And we can do that by feeling and watching and listening, and then just have a best guess as to what we think is going on underneath the skin, which is better than not having a guess at all or understanding what it might look like underneath the skin. 
And for today's purposes, and I don't mean to patronize you or oversimplify it, it really is just a ball and a socket. It's the head of the condyle and the glenoid fossa. And in between the ball and socket is a piece of fibrocartilage, so uninnervated tissue that's fat in the back, fat in the front, and skinny in the middle. And in a perfect world, the skinny part of that disc follows, sort of hovers above the head of the condyle, the ball, as it moves out of the socket. And remember, the cool, and I tell patients this all the time, the cool thing is, this is the only joint in the body that is made to dislocate when you use it. It's a little more complex. Could you imagine what it would be, what it would feel like or look like, look like if our shoulders or our hips or our knees or our ankles or our wrists, all of our joints dislocated every time we used them? We wouldn't be able to function. However, our temporomandibular joint is made literally to basically dislocate when we open. The ball comes out of the socket. And so it's nice to understand how the ball comes out of the socket, that the disc is supposed to move with it, and that the disc is actually held on. It's tethered. It's basically held on by a ligament in the back and a muscle in the front, the lateral pterygoid. And that's really basically the system. Ball in a socket, piece of fibrocartilage that's fat in the front, fat in the back, and skinny in the middle. And that, and that, um, and that disc is held on by a ligament in the back and a muscle in the front. The only other thing it's nice to know is that we have a whole bunch of innervated tissue, the retrodiscal tissue, behind it. That's where the blood vessels and the nerve endings are. And so when we think about doing an assessment, one of the first things we could do is just, you know, for our patients, is just how do we think the joint's doing today? Just get an assessment. Well, we can feel for inflammation. So the first thing we have to do is find the joint. We have our patient open and close so we can find it. And then we put our finger on the outside of the joint through, you know, right through the skin and just ask, do you have any tension, tenderness, or discomfort? Because if there is, and we're just using about three to five pounds of pressure, which is when your fingernails start to blanch, if that's about that much pressure, there really should be no tension, tenderness, or discomfort. And if there is, you might think to yourself, oh, it's a little inflamed, just like a lot of our other joints in our body. But at least you know that. Now, what are you actually feeling when you look at the video on the left? You're really only feeling the lateral pull. It's nice to remember that the the joint actually has an outside lateral pole and inside the medial pole, it's got a front, it's got a back, and the disc runs over the whole surface. It's three-dimensional, right? And so what we're feeling really is only a small part of it, but it's better than nothing, right? And we can certainly uh, feel the back side of the joint by having our patient open real big, as you see here, and then putting our finger sort of push through the skin a little bit. Or you can literally use the ear hole your external auditory meatus to get to the backside as well and feel and ask the patient, do you have any tension, tenderness, or discomfort for inflammation? Now, the other thing as they're opening and closing, we could be using our fingers to hear. And what are we feeling or hearing with our fingers? Well, a quiet joint would, be, would look like this, this great video that we've used forever, which is as the ball comes out of the socket, the skinny part of the disc travels on top of the head of the condyle. And then when we bite together, the ball goes back up in the socket. That would be a quiet joint. Well, what do you hear with your fingers or hear with a stethoscope sometimes when we open and close? And for today, I'd like us to make an, an assumption that most of the time it is exactly this. It's an anterior disc displacement that it pops on when it comes forward. And then when the ball goes back in the socket, it pops off. And you're like, that's a bummer. And as you move forward, it pops on. You think to yourself, that is good news. Stay there. That's where you belong. And then it pops off and you're like, that is a bummer. And sometimes you've got to really work to pop on like that. And you're like, whew, baby, that took a lot of work to get there. I would suggest that you stay there this time. And then it pops off and you're like, that's a bummer. But at least, you know, when I hear a click, what I'm thinking to myself is, oh, that's a little piece of the disc that popped on, and that's good news. At least I know you were there for 90% of the time. But let's think three-dimensionally, because it's really not the whole disc, is it? Almost never is it the whole disc. It's usually a tiny little piece of it off the lateral pole, as you see here. So when I hear a click, I think, oh, that's a little tiny piece that fell off, and then when you started to open it, popped on, and then you were where you belonged. And now I have a vision of what's going on underneath the skin. On the right-hand side here, sometimes it's a bigger pop. Farther down, you're like, oh, baby, that took a lot of work to get there. 
And now the vision I have in my head is it's a little bit, it's a little more of the disc, a little more beefy part of it, uh, bigger. And it, and it took a little more effort to pop on a little farther down. I'm like, well, that's a bummer. It's probably more of the disc. I may not always be right, but I'll bet I'm really, really close. And so to help all of us understand why we're hearing what we're hearing, it's nice to know that when you bite on your back teeth, the pressure on the temporomandibular joint is actually not straight up the middle. It's on the medial pole. And so when we translate, when the ball comes out of the socket, the force actually moves from the medial pole to the lateral pole. And why is that important? Because if in fact, there is a tiny piece of the disc that is off, and then it pops on. Now start to think about where is the pressure when it pops on? Right as it's popping on, where's the pressure? It's moving right to where it's trying to pop on. You're like, no wonder that was such a big click. The pressure is exactly the wrong spot at the wrong time. Well, that's okay. At least I understand why it sounds like what it sounds like. So we all, you all love a quiet joint, which is what you see on the left-hand side. The the disc is staying where it belongs from the beginning of opening to the end of opening and all the way back together. That would be a quiet joint. Well, so is the video you see on the right. There's no click, there's no pop here. The disc, this disc really is off. There's no clicker and a pop. And you think, well, Kevin, how do I understand that that's happening? And that's when we finish assessing the joint and we actually just watch our patient open and close. How is the hinge working? And we look for deviations. Does the jaw move to the left or does it move to the right? Because in a perfect world, we want the ball, the ball on both sides to come out of the socket in a symmetrical manner. And that would mean the jaw opens straight down the midline. So why would a jaw deviate to the left or to the right? We'll start to think about a little disc popping on on one side and a little different on the other side. Or we're having to pop on on one side and the other side doesn't pop on at all. They're moving at different rates because the body's trying to get it to work well. And so the jaw deviates a little bit. And then when you close back together, sometimes you do a little S curve. I call a little S curve upon closing. Um, and that is, uh, you know, oftentimes that would be the body trying to accommodate or compensate, which is a big part of occlusion um, for something that doesn't feel right or make it a little easier. So we can just watch the hinge. The last thing I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up today is a load test, meaning we want to shove the ball up into the socket and see how it feels for the patient. Now, we, I bring this up because it should always feel good. In fact, when we load the joint, as I said earlier, you see the photo or the image, the illustration on the right. When we load the joint and we bite together, where is the force? It's on the medial pole close to the brain. And as we open, remember, it moves to the lateral. So when we actually shove the ball into the socket, we call that a load test. Where are we really loading? Well, we're really loading the medial pole. And so we're getting, we're really assessing, is there a good piece of disc on the medial pole where we load? I would just like to know that. And what is the easiest way, in my opinion, to load the joint? It is actually to, in other words, to shove the ball up in the socket. And that is to use the muscles of mastication, our big temporalis and our big masseter they will pull, that's their job. They pull the ball up into the socket and we can assist that by using a leaf gauge. And so how do we use a leaf gauge? You say to your patient, you wanna just keep back teeth apart. So we, we put a leaf gauge in and we say to the patient, slide forward, slide back, and then gently squeeze like you're trying to bite on back teeth. Well, as the patient slides forward, slides back and gently squeezes like they're trying to bite on back teeth, the temporalis and the masseter are literally loading the ball into the socket. And then we can ask our patients, do you feel any tension, tenderness, or discomfort? And if they don't, you just have a pretty good idea that at least a big beefy part of the medial pole of the disc is where it belongs in the temporomandibular joint. And then you combine that to a little click and think that's just a little piece of the outside. You combine that with a little inflammation that maybe you felt or didn't feel. And now you have a pretty good assessment, don't you? as to what you think is going on underneath the skin. You've got a vision of what you think is going on underneath the skin because this is going to impact the predictability of our dentistry and our treatment planning uh, and our understanding of what's going on with the patient. So by listening, by watching um, and feeling, we have a good idea as to what is going on underneath the skin. Now, I know when I, I went over that sort of quickly, just to get that in your brain, 
Now, the other thing when we think about occlusion is what impacts the way the teeth come together besides the way the joint is working, the actual hinge, is the actual muscles. And why do we evaluate muscles? And which muscles do we evaluate? Does it make sense? Are we just trying to impress our patients? And for me, I think about going to the gym, right? Now, I, I tends to be, I tend to exercise on a fairly regular basis. So I think about going to the gym. But when we go to the gym, what's happening to our muscles? We're using them and or abusing them. Or if we don't go to the gym or don't use our muscles, what's happening to them? They're not being used, they're shrinking, they're atrophying. So our muscles are either hypertrophying or atrophying. And if you're going to the gym on a regular basis, then you're gonna have big sore muscles. Well, what do we know about going to the gym in the dental world? Going to the gym is doing stuff with our teeth. And that might make our muscles big or sore. And think about your temporalis. Think about your masseter. These are big muscles that really only flex, they only grow for the most part when our back teeth are touching, when we're going to the gym and doing weird things. And so we palpate muscles to have an understanding of how often are we going to the gym? What exercises do we think we're doing at the gym? Think about the stupid exercises our patients do at the chewing gym, whether it's being moving their jaw to one side, playing with a certain spot, and maybe it's because they can't breathe as well. They're going to the gym and doing some stupid exercises. And think about the lateral pterygoids. We've got the temporalis and the master. The lateral pterygoid tells us a lot about what the patient is doing and how their body is having to compensate. Its main job is to pull the ball out of the socket. Well, why is that important? And why would we actually go to the extent of palpating all the way back here? And that is, be is because that muscle is our biggest compensator or accommodator for a chewing system that is not working in harmony, which we'll go into detail in a minute. But that is the reason that we palpate muscles to understand how much is our body compensating and are we going to the gym? How often are we going to the gym and what stupid exercises are we doing at the gym? And then of course, why are we doing those exercises? Now, the last thing is, what if I just had you, if I said, hey, bite on your back teeth and move to one side and then keep moving as far as you can to that side. And what am I doing right now? I'm just doing a little assessment. Are your front teeth doing the job they're supposed to do? And then I have you go to the other side, start coming up a little bit, move as far as you can. And I'm just looking to see, do I think that your front teeth are doing the job they're supposed to do? And then end to end. Now, if I were to put some articulating tape, whether it be Acufilm or Madam Butterfly or one of those in your mouth, and I put red Madam Butterfly in and had you go side to side and front and back. And then I put green Madam Butterfly in and had you tap, tap. In a perfect world, where would you expect to see the red? Well, you'd expect to see the red only on front teeth mostly, because that's when you're moving side to side and front and back, and it's the front teeth's job to protect the back teeth. And where would you expect to see the green? Well, I would expect in a perfect world to see the green on all the back teeth, evenly and simultaneously, cusp tip to flat landing area. And what you see from Tony here, who broke that second molar is, She's got a lot of red on back teeth in weird places. She's got, so you basically, I'm not saying this to patronize you. You got your, you got your guiders in the front. It's their job to protect your back teeth. And you got the squeezers in the back and that's their only job. So what happens when a squeezer pretends to be a guider? Well, nothing good. And it might be what, what helped Tony break that cusp and why she's on the edge of breaking more. And maybe that's why she's got a couple of gold restorations, but nobody really looked at that back then. They just, she broke something and they put something on there and she kept going to the gym and doing the stupid exercises. So when we think about assessing the current status, I think, do we have an, do we have a best guess as to what's going on underneath the skin with the temporomandibular joint? Have we evaluated the muscles if for no other reason but to, but to think, are they going to the gym? How often and what exercise are they doing? And do we look at how the teeth are coming together? And are the front teeth doing the job they're supposed to do? And are the back teeth doing the job that they're supposed to do? And now you're saying, Kevin, that takes a long time in my practice. I got bills to pay. I got other things to do. I got patients to see. And one of my challenges for everybody today when we talk about occlusion is, is really just how can we simplify it? Well, how long would it take me right now if you were in my chair to put my, to find your joint, have you open and close, find your temporomandibular joint, 
put my fingers on just the lateral pole and ask you with and push with three to five pounds of pressure, ask you if you feel any tension, tenderness, or discomfort. And while my fingers are there, I'm going to ask you to open and close. And while you're opening and closing, I'm going to feel for any clicking and popping on either side and have a vision of what I think is happening based on the timing and the and the pressure of the of the noises. And while you're opening and closing, I'm just going to watch your jaw to see if it deviates to the left and the right. How long does that take? Not so long. But I've, I have this vision of what I think is going on with the hinge. And now how long would it take me to palpate just your temporalis, one of your big squeezer muscles, your masseter, your other big squeezer muscle, and then your lateral pterygoid, your big compensator, three muscles on each side, just a couple of minutes or less. And then how long would it take me to just have you bite together and have you move side to side and just get a good idea? Do I think your squeezers are squeezing and your guiders are guiding? Because if they're not, I'm pretty sure things aren't going to be going very well. So what we just described there, what we've been describing in interesting words, is what is a system in harmony? What does optimal look like? And if you can't put words to it and or your team can't put words to it, then how can we help our patients move in that direction? Or how the heck do we know what we're seeing when we do an exam, right? So my words for today in October of 2022 would be my, an optimal system would be when the ball comes out of the socket, right? So when the ball comes out of the socket, I want it to come out on both sides as smooth as possible. But when the ball comes back up into the socket, I want the muscles on the left working in harmony with the muscles on the right to bring your lower jaw up to your top jaw. But when it does, I want the ball to be in the socket. And then when you move your teeth from side to side, I would love it if your front teeth made your back teeth come apart, but in a real smooth, shallow manner so that they don't beat themselves up. And that the gums and bone that holds your teeth in are disease free so that your teeth don't wobble. And what happens when we have this harmonious or optimal system is you get to eat healthy foods. Your teeth are really maintainable probably by default they're going to look good and probably you can beat your system up without having things break down for a while and that and if we can help our patients move towards that or have an understanding of what that is and put words to it i know that that's going to impact your practice tomorrow so if that is harmony then what is disharmony well let's just talk about disharmony meaning occlusion if in fact the guiders aren't guiding and squeezers are guiding what is going to be the issue? Is it going to be tooth mobility? Is it going to be frematis? Is it going to be bone loss? Is it going to be recession? Is it going to be fractures? Is it going to be, is it going to be wear facets? Is it going to be non-carious class five uh, lesions? So when, it, when a system is in disharmony, we're going to see something, right? And for most of us sitting here right now, most of you and most of us, your body is in a slight is in disharmony, let's just say. It's compensating. In other words, when you bite together right now and you go to have a comfortable bite, the ball has to come out of the socket a little bit because all of your teeth don't touch with the ball in the socket. So what your body does is it says, oh, that's not comfortable. I'm going to slide forward a little bit. And that means that lateral pterygoid muscle that we talked about has to pull the ball out of the socket so that you can have a better bite. We would call that your maximum intercuspation or your acquired bite. And the cool thing is you don't even know that's happening and neither do your patients. Until when? Until they do. Until we overload the system and our body's compensatory um, gifts uh, can't compensate anymore. We overload the system. And when you think about how much is your body having to compensate, just watch this. So the, right now the, on the left-hand slide, the ball is in the socket. And when we come together, even though the teeth don't touch, the blue line is there. But as we move, as your body compensates, look how far forward your mandible moves. The ball comes out of the socket. The lateral pterygoid has to pull. That's a compensatory movement. And when we look at the video on the right, sometimes it doesn't, you're, it doesn't feel good. And so your jaw doesn't move forward but the ball sort of dislocates, it lodges out of the socket or it even distalizes, it gets shoved back and down into the socket because it's locked in, the bite just doesn't feel good. So what I hope you're seeing right now 
is that our chewing system is a closed system, meaning we wish it was just this wheel moving along, but the joints impact the muscles. The joints impact the muscles, impact the way the teeth come together. The joints impact the muscles, impact the way the teeth come together, impact the periodontium. And when one of those things is out of whack, it's going to have an impact on every other part of the system. That's a closed system. Now, for better or worse, we wish it was only joints, muscles, teeth, and periodontium. But what are the other things that are part of our chewing system that impact it? How we breathe, how we sleep, how we manage stress. When one of those things is out of whack, I promise you it's gonna impact your system. So how do we document all of this? Well, again, as we're evaluating, doing our exam, as I've sort of just discussed the, 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 um, the functional part of the exam so far, we're starting to think, oh, I'm gonna use this information to help my patient understand what optimal is. And yet it still feels sort of overwhelming. Now, I'm, I've been influenced by Frank Spear, obviously by Pankey, and John Coyce um, is also one of my favorite influences. And you know, when we start to think in those categories, um, biology, functional, um, structural, anesthetics, and we start to put those into green, yellow, or red, in other words, can we as dentists evaluate each part, each category, and can we, do we have enough information to say whether it is green, yellow, or red? Because if it's red, I promise you it's going to have an impact on the greens. And if you've got a couple of yellows and a couple of greens, I'm starting to get worried about the greens. And if you've got a bunch of yellows and a red, I'm thinking your whole chewing system is messed up and we better figure out what it takes to get you in better shape. So to simplify it, again, I think at the end of our evaluation of our patients, my hope is that we can just think in those categories, do I think it's green, yellow, orange, or red? Now, everything I've said so quickly this morning, um, it, it really is in this book, again, Pete Dawson has also been quite influential in my life. And if you haven't read this book, Functional Occlusion from TMJ to Smile Design, it takes everything I've said and he makes it even simpler because it doesn't have to be so complex. Um, so a great book, I thought I'd throw that out for you. So we talked about the adaptive zone. And so in occlusion with our patients, think about maybe this verbiage might help you as well. I'm, I'm hoping it will. Our bodies all adapt, we've talked about that. They do it without us even thinking about it. And when we're in our adaptive zone, our, our bodies are compensating and things are going well. We don't notice it because our body is compensating. However, when we go beyond our adaptive capacity, that's when I would say we move into the danger zone. That is when we see signs and symptoms. And in dentistry, what are the signs and symptoms we see? Our patients might tell us, I have pain, things are changing. What we see is frematis, mobility, cracks, wear facets, drifting of teeth, uh, you name it, sore muscles, um, headaches. That would be the danger zone. So for me, I think about what is it going to take to get my patient to move more towards the middle of their adaptive zone in a way that is appropriate for them. So as they continue to beat up their system, guess where they still are? They're still in the adaptive zone. And as they get older, guess where they still are? In the adaptive zone. But if we were to, if we don't help them move towards the middle of that zone of adaptability, and they are right here, and then they continue to beat up their system or overload their system so quickly they're gonna have signs or symptoms. And so even patients that have signs and symptoms, guess where we, where we can move them? Back towards the middle of that zone of adaptability. So how do we know how much their bodies are accommodating or compensating? Well, you remember one of our, um, one, I guess not our, one of my, definitions of optimal harmonious is when the ball is in the socket all the teeth touch evenly and simultaneously and so we can take a bite record and an easy way is by using a leaf gauge right so we literally can can have our patients slide forward back squeeze gently like they're trying to bite on back teeth slide forward back squeeze gently like they're trying to bite on back teeth so we're deprogramming the lateral pterygoid the muscles are shoving the ball into the socket until we take enough leaves out that the patient starts to get close to having a tooth touch. And eventually the patient's gonna slide forward back and squeeze and they're gonna feel a tooth touch. Now that is the tooth that touches with the ball in the socket. You can call it centric relation if you want. In a perfect world, 
how many teeth would you like touching with the ball in the socket? And we already said all of them. And what we just learned about this patient is that when the ball is in the socket, they only have one or maybe two teeth touching. It might be three, it might be four, but it's certainly not all of them. And so whether we use a leaf gauge or you can do the same thing with an anterior to programmer or a Lucia jig, same thing. Our body is, is accommodating, right? The ball is out of the socket. We put anything in a leaf gauge or a Lucia jig, patient slides forward and back, forward and back. The ball, ball is um, getting moved into the socket as a lateral pterygoid um, is um, deprogramming. Now we put a little index on a Lucia jig or this is the same as a leaf gauge. Now we take a bite record, whether it be silicone, wax, I don't care what it is. We take a bite record with the ball in the socket. Now we can see on an articulator a little more easily how much the, our patient is compensating because we mount the top and bottom arch. We see the tooth that touched with the ball in the socket and now we can watch them squeeze in the max maricus patient. We can see how much our patient is, a, how much our patient's bodies are accommodating or compensating, which is better than not. Now they might not be doing anything about it, or they might not be doing anything for their body to not like it. I guess that is a terrible way to say that. But in other words, if they're not doing much with their teeth and their body is having to compensate, great. At least we know they're compensating. However, for Tony, I don't think it's going very well for her. And so whether we take a bite record with a leaf gauge or a Lucia jig, remember, you're still in the arc of closure. So you can be open several millimeters with a bite record. Give, give yourself, offer yourself a little grace because then we're just going to close the pin down. And now what do we see? We see the tooth that touches with the ball in the socket. Now, today we don't get to spend too much time in the digital world. But can we do this in the digital world? Oh yeah, we've been doing it since about 2014, right? Um, that is the, those are the teeth that touch with the ball in the socket. And can you do it in the Serona world? Yes. Can you do it in the three shape world? Yes. And I show you this because, you know, maybe you're scanning the upper and lower arch and maybe you've got the patient in centric relation right now, the ball in the socket. So you're taking a bite record. And it can be very easy if you know why you're doing what you're doing, because as as you've already scanned the upper and lower arch, you've got a bite record with a ball in the socket. You're scanning the relationship of the bite. What you have right now is an upper and lower arch mounted in centric, centric relation on a virtual articulator. Much easier than what it is in the analog world. But if you don't know what you were doing in the analog world, it's probably not going to help you so much. And so we've assessed the system. And now, real quickly, I just I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up. We have to talk about the three things that impact the system. What are the three main things that impact what we just saw that impact occlusion? And one is sleep, the way we breathe at nighttime. There are a lot of different ways to help our patients be curious about it, whether it's the Sleep Lab app on your iPhone, whether it's an aura ring, a uh, high-res pulse ox, or a home sleep test. And when you think, why would I do that? Well, because if they're not sleeping well, they're going to the gym and doing stupid things to their teeth at nighttime, and you're having to restore them. And that's decreasing the predictability. And one of the things that I would say every patient um, we talk about is, can you breathe through your nose? Because if you can't breathe through your nose, and you are an obligatory mouth breather, especially at nighttime, I promise you, you're probably destroying your teeth. And that might be one of the reasons we're restoring them. And that's going to decrease the predictability of what's going on. And also, do you think nutrition might play a role in why occlusion might be breaking down? Because there is a lot of, there was a lot, was a lot of acid going on it, but with like a case of soda pop a day. And that might impact um, so when we start to evaluate what, what, what our patients are taking in, that impacts the occlusion as well. We talk about nutrition all the time. It's just mostly sugar, but we can start to have conversations about that. And you can certainly integrate nutritionists into your practice. I do it with practices all the time. If it makes sense, you don't have to be the one. You can just have a referral source that understands how you're integrating it into your dental practice because it's impacting your, the occlusion with your patients. What is the third thing that's impacting the occlusion? You all get it. 
it is wellness. How are we handling our stresses in life? How are we managing stress, our coping mechanisms? It doesn't mean we have to fix it, but we can certainly talk about it. And if in fact we are living on high sympathetic tone, as opposed to parasympathetic tone, which is that is your vagus nerve that you see on the left, what can we help our patients understand to maybe help them um, save their teeth longer or help our dentistry be more predictable? It might just be learning how to tap into your parasympathetic nervous system a little bit more, breathing just a little bit more. And, and I know that's around a whole bunch. Um, I had to throw this book out there as well. Um, I'm friends, good friends with Wit, who used to teach at Dawson. He's now teaching at, at Panky with us. Um, and everything I have talked about so far in the last 35 minutes or so, 40 minutes, um, it is in great depth in this book, The Shift. It, the connection between systemic health, nutritional health, sleep health, um, um, wellness, and the impact it has on teeth and how we can integrate that into dentistry. So a great book, um, but it is, it's, it's, a, it's a slow read. So, um, I mean, it's awesome. Just um, don't be tired when you start reading it. Be, be ready to want to learn. So now that we've looked at the three things that impact what we saw, we have to have a way to identify what optimal is for our patients. What does optimal look like? And for me, that is actually to restore. Well, when we say restore, I gave you my words earlier, but if we go back to, um, uh, to Pete Dawson's words, it is all you see in these bullet points right here. You see, because if we can't put words to what optimal is to restore our patient back to optimal health, then we can't really help, all, help our patients or, and or our team uh, move in that direction. The only thing that I would say that Pete was missing when he, brought, when he um, wrote this book that I would add a bullet point at the bottom right now would be, you can breathe through your nose. That would be the only thing I would add. And that would be my definition of optimal. So how do we start to get a vision of what optimal is? Well, for me, no matter what the patient walks in with, it is always a starting place of are the front teeth in the right place in the head to do the job they're supposed to do? You may call it aesthetics. I say it's edge position. And because if the teeth are not, or maybe they are, as you see with Tony here, maybe they're close, are the teeth in a decent spot to do the job they're supposed to do? Because if the front teeth are not in the right place in the head to do the job they're supposed to do, we're not going to be able to get to what optimal is. We're not going to be able to get all the teeth touching evenly and simultaneously. We're not going to get the front teeth to disclude the back teeth in a smooth, shallow manner. We're not going to be able to create optimal. My hope is the ball comes out of the socket when we bite back together, all the teeth touch evenly and simultaneously. And when I say evenly and simultaneously, I'm thinking literally, I wanna have a vision of cuss tip to flat landing area on the bottom teeth, but also obviously cuss tip to flat landing area on the top teeth. And the way teeth touch would be the back teeth touch just a little harder, although evenly and simultaneously, just a little harder than front teeth because that's their job. They're the squeezers. And the guider's job is to guide. And so when we move in any direction, I would want the front teeth to disclude or protect the back teeth in a real smooth, shallow manner, even beyond cuspid rise. That's what we call crossover. And that's something that nathology and OBI um, don't, um, although OBI is changing, they're starting to give a little more freedom beyond cuspid rise. But it, it's, we don't need it to be steep and locked in. We just, need to, we just need to protect the back teeth in a smooth, shallow manner, in the smoothest, shallowest manner possible, because that's gonna be good for the joints and the muscles. And so when we have this vision of what optimal is, that's now when we start to use these, these categories. So for instance, with Tony, no matter what she walks in for, what is the first thing, no matter what, that I am gonna start to assess? How much tooth should be showing with lip at rest? And then compare that, that's sort of your check and balance. Does that still make sense when she smiles? So photos become important. Your lip at rest photo and your smile photo become really critical. And then we outline the existing teeth. You start to see the irregularities and asymmetries. And this is critical for occlusion and treatment planning, which is if we know where we want the incisal edge in the head, then we measure proper height to width ratio and now we actually have this comparison between where our patients are and what optimal looks like. 
And then we have to do the same on the bottom teeth. Where do the lower teeth belong in the head? So in the end, what we really want as a starting place is to identify where in a perfect world, where do you want the front 12 teeth in the head? Doesn't I didn't say how we were going to do it yet, but if you don't know what that would look like, then they're probably not going to be able to do the job that you want them to do, which is to protect the back teeth. So I mentioned earlier DSD, which I'm a big fan of here initially was the problem with DSD and with treatment planning that didn't make sense. You would say, well, OK, Kevin said proper height to width ratio. Those teeth look pretty good. And then whether in the digital world or the analog world, we'd send a um, we'd send models to the lab and say, do a wax up, make those teeth look good. Except what you didn't do is you forgot to have your lip at rest photo and full smile photo or identify are those incisal edges already where they belong in the head? Because they are. You see, because he's had wear and secondary eruption and the incisal edges are where they belong. And so if we start to identify, and now you can start yeah, get into the digital world, we can use our photos very intentionally, have similar data points. But in the end, what I want you to identify is where do you want the incisal edge position? Put that there and then measure the proper height to width ratio, which is going to give you an idea of what optimal looks like. And once we know what that looks like, what can we do? Well, now we've got our models, whether it be in the analog or digital world, you start to see why a face bowl might be important, right? We want to have that top arch where it belongs so that we can also put the bottom arch where it belongs in space. Um, however, real quickly, I have to, because a lot of you hate face bows as well. Well, in the digital world, we have come a long ways. Um, Coise has come up with glasses, but you have to take those photos, right? Lip at rest, full smile, and then a retracted. And then you put these cool glasses on um, that, that allow everything to be along the same plane, which becomes an STL file that now is a, um, a Facebook in the digital world. The other is maybe combine the um, analog and digital world. It, I'm OK putting something in somebody's ears and a nasia on. That's not so scary. But imagine that you've already scanned the upper and lower arch and you just don't want to do a Facebook. Well, what if you just had a little silicone? And now you just have the patient put their incisal edges almost like a panel, right? Except you've scanned the upper and lower arch already. So now you're just rescanning from about premolars forward. And there are a bunch of data points underneath this. And so now those data points are combined with the scan of your full arch. And you basically now have a digit, an STL file that allows you to put the top arch in space where it belongs, just like a face bow. And so a lot of the things that we used to hate are coming around pretty nicely, aren't they? Regardless, whether you're in the digital world or the analog world, what are we gonna do with this right now? Well, in a perfect world, in a systematic approach, what we really wanna do is start with the front 12 teeth, just like you did on your photos. So you've got models mounted in a fully seated collar position and whether it's grinding away or adding wax, the first thing you're gonna do is get those front six teeth on the top where they belong. Grind them, move them, add whatever it is, and then come down and do the same on the bottom. Grind them, move them, add them, I don't care. That doesn't mean that's how we're going to do it. And now we get to see, are the guiders guiding? Cuspiderized to crossover, cuspiderized to crossover, and end to end. The only thing that we can do at the, that we, I would say we, should be doing at the exact same time is get rid of the balancing interferences. Do two things at once because sometimes the front teeth aren't doing the job that they're supposed to do or it doesn't feel smooth is because we still have some balancing interferences in the back. So as you're moving from side to side and front and back, you can get rid of those balancing interferences. Now we're smooth. Cuspiderize to crossover, cuspiderize to crossover, and end to end. And now that we've got the front teeth where they belong, and we and we didn't say how we're going to do it yet, we just see what's possible. Now all we have to do is to get the back teeth to touch evenly and simultaneously with the ball in the socket. So we take a look. What's close right now? What cusp tips are close to what flat landing areas? Actually make some notes. What cusp tips are already hovering over a fossa? What cusp tips are already hovering over a marginal ridge? What landing area looks beautiful right now? It just doesn't have a cusp tip in the right place above it. And so we start to make notes so that as we tap tap on the articulator, we are intentionally recontouring, maybe moving a little bit. 
And then all of a sudden we have a blueprint, albeit ugly as heck, of what optimal looks like for our patient. What does that look like for our patient? And now we get to structure because really only one of these six things is the treatment plan for each tooth. Are you, can you just recontour it? Do you need to reposition it? Are you gonna restore it? What's the material? Do you need to remove it and replace it? Or my favorite is the sixth treatment plan for a tooth. Sometimes you just leave it around because that tooth is in the right place in the head doing the job it's supposed to do. That's the treatment plan. But this is a really systematic approach. But this is when I think you sit down with your specialist and say, I've got this blueprint. I've got the occlusion dialed in. I know where I want the edges. I know it's because of where things belong in the face. But man, it seems like there's 11 different ways to do it. And your specialists go, no, there's 18 different ways to do it. Let's figure out what way is most appropriate for your patient. Because that's when we say, do we have the biology to support the structure for the function that's optimal that all started with putting the front 12 teeth in the right place in the head? And that's when we sit down with our specialists. And don't forget, these days we have to add airway. Because if airway is a component, everything we do is going to become less predictable. And now we have a vision of what optimal is. Now let's take the time to actually say to our patient, I know that form follows function. And yes, I can just fix that one tooth, Tony. And I can do that if that's what we think is appropriate. But what I'm worried about is if I just put that tooth back in the situation that caused it to break in the first place. What I'm concerned about is the teeth on the other side. And now you can have a conversation with your patient about it in a really more confident, competent way. And that's what we started this whole, this last hour with. And now we can take steps that are appropriate. Remember we said that's appropriate dentistry. And so for Tony, I'll just walk you through it because everybody wants to know. So basically um, her the structure that was appropriate for her 12 front teeth, top six and bottom six, was a little composite on her number six, a little composite on number 10, and a little recontouring of number 11 and recontouring her lower incisors. When then when I had her slide side to side, I saw all those balancing interferences and I knew where to start moving cuss tips. And while she was having the root canal and crown lengthening on the second molar, I put a provisional on and got a great stop on there. So right now, where is Tony in that zone of adaptability? If that's all I ever did for her, where is she right now? She's doing great. But now she can come in and on the top left, I can, or on the left-hand side, I can remove those faulty restorations and the broken tooth and that poor um, onlay. And I know where I want these teeth now, don't I? I know where I want the cuss tip. I know where I want the landing area. I can plan it very intentionally because when function is decided, structure makes less of a difference. When your body's not having to compensate, the structure becomes pretty easy. And for her, actually, it was composite on the top left and lithium disilicate on the bottom. And that was a great place. And it wasn't perfect, but she was better. But she can come back many months later and I can do the same on the right hand side. And I can continue to dial in the bite, recontour a little bit, make the front teeth a little bit smoother, make that crossover a little bit smoother. But when I go to treatment plan, I already know where I want the cuss tips and flat landing areas because I saw it. I had a blueprint of what that looked like. And in the end for Tony, this is, might not be perfect, but true or false, this is a full mouth rehabilitation. She is so close to the zone, to the middle of that zone of adaptability right now. She's got her front teeth discluding her back teeth in a smooth, shallow manner. She's got a lot of back teeth touching evenly and simultaneously, cuss tip to flat landing area with the ball in the socket. And this full mouth rehabilitation was what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of composite and one, two, three pieces of lithium disilicate. And that is dentistry that I think is appropriate for our patients. The front teeth are now doing a good job of discluding the back teeth. All the back teeth are touching evenly and simultaneously. That's the gift that we have for our patients all the time. And occlusion plays a big part of that. However, don't forget, because those of you who know me know that you can't do this alone. We create team-centered systems, some structure around it with our team, and don't forget along the way, you gotta tap into your parasympathetic tone. We gotta breathe a little bit. It doesn't have to feel like fight or flight all the time. You can have fun while you're doing it. And 
I know that was a lot, but I know it can make a difference. And mostly I appreciate if you paid attention at all. Um, I, appreci I appreciate your attention today. If it made an impact for you at all today, um, that makes my day a little bit better. And if it didn't, don't tell anybody. Let's just keep that between you and me. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing right now and see if anybody's still here. Oh, there's like two people here. Thank you, Kevin. Nice. You're welcome. That was Thanks excellent. for having me. I know I learned a ton and I'm sitting here going, does anybody, if you know, we have a break coming up, but if you want to stay, stick around and um, do a little assessment on the articulation of my, my jaw here, I'd appreciate that. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments? All you the know, Saul were here or Rob was here or Matt was paying attention. You know, I know all you guys, so we're, oh, and Chad. Oh. Nice try, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. All right, well, you all know where to find Kevin for follow-up. Um, I'm looking forward to sending this out to the rest of the membership. I think uh, everybody could greatly benefit from uh, taking a listen to this presentation. Kevin, thank you so much, as always, uh, for joining us today, as well as supporting our membership.